Hello, Hare Krishna. Sorry we're late. We had a few, uh, what do you call it, gremlins in the machine. But now we're ready to go. Welcome all of you. And tonight what I want to do is go back to reading from my article called Confessions of a Japa Retreat Junkie. So, I want to welcome Jeff. Darren, Holy Grass, and all the others who are present tonight. Does anyone remember what we talked about last week? Let's see if even I remember. We talked about giving our heart to Krishna. We talked about praying during Japa. And Japa is a, so it's a way to pray so we talked about how you could pray, how you can connect with Krishna. And one of the things we talked about was giving our heart, Krishna accept my heart. And just yesterday I was reading something very nice, how Krishna is connected to everyone and everything, but he's not connected to everyone's heart. And that's what he really wants. So we're all part of Krishna, so there's that connection. And the whole universe is part of Krishna. But... Krishna wants to connect to everyone's heart. And so when we give our heart, then we connect with Krishna's heart. So last week, we're, one of the things we talked about was giving our heart to Krishna when we chant and pray. And Krishna, accept my heart or let my heart come closer to yours. So that's a very nice way of thinking. And we also talked about different ways we can feel when we're chanting, Krishna, uplift me, bring me closer to you. And just basically being intentional with, with our bhakti as we pray to the holy name. So now I wanted to read some interesting things that I wrote. Hello, Joseph. And when you write your name, can you let us know where you're from? So we know. Cause some of you have the same name and we don't know who you are unless we know where you're from. Okay, so I'm going to read. And this section is entitled... Does the holy name really work? Of course, what it sounds like a very faithless statement. Does the holy name really work? What I mean by that is sometimes when I chant, I don't chant well enough for the holy name to work, and then I doubt the potency. I'm sure you've all had that experience, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta describes that, that sometimes we lose faith in the holy name when we commit offenses while we chant. Because we don't get any realization, we don't, get, we don't get any taste, nothing seems to be happening, and then we, begin, may, we may begin to doubt the uh, power of the Holy Name. So that's what this section is about. Jeff is from Boulder, Holy Grass is near Atlanta. Near Atlanta, we're having a retreat starting tomorrow in the Bluegrass Mountains, just north of Atlanta. Joseph is from, is from Massachusetts. Darren from Orlando, and yours truly from the little town of Alachua, where one out of every seven people is a Hare Krishna devotee. No, is that true? No. One out of ten. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Does the holy name really work? Yes, the holy name really does work. Well, let me restate that. The holy name does really work if I chant the holy name the way the holy name is meant to be chanted. If I don't properly chant the holy name, then I start thinking the chanting can't really uproot my deepest anarthas. If, you, if you've been chanting for a long time and, and you're still dealing with a lot of internal conflict, contamination, anartha, problems, obstacles, that seem uh, like they're going to stick to your heart forever, like kind of like they were glued to your heart, then it's possible you may doubt the effect of the Holy Name and, and by thinking, well, I've been chanting for so long and they, these anarthas, these unwanted things are still there, so does it really work? Because I am not experiencing Krishna while I chant, I lose faith in the value and power of the Holy Name. Going to the retreat and being facilitated to chant some really good rounds was a major faith builder. The 
The holy name began to work on me more deeply than ever. It was real, vibrant, active, and dynamic as compared to the usual dead mantras I chant. Have any of you ever chanted dead mantras? What's a dead mantra? You think, no, Krishna's in his name. No. Krishna's, Krishna appears when the attitude of service, when we chant with the attitude of service. Then Krishna's present. It's not, it's not that automatically is Krishna's present in his name. Um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur said that Krishna is not present just in the alphabets, K-R-S-N-A. But Krishna is present when he's chant when the name is chanted with bhakti with a mood of service. So <clears throat> therefore it said you can chant dead mantras. And I'm sure you've all experienced at some point in time chanting some rounds of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and not feeling inspired by that chanting and, and basically feeling like not much different than if you didn't chant. So we could call those dead mantras. So what happens when you chant dead mantras? That's described here. Dead mantras were producing a dead Mahatma Das. But the Maha Mantra is a living thing, and when I chant a living mantra, I get life. So if after we finish our chanting, we don't feel inspired and enlivened, then we can say, well, I guess my chant, I've been chanting dead mantras. If the mantra is actually a living thing, if it has the mood of service and prayer and connection with Krishna, then we'll feel inspired, obviously. We'll feel life. And so, as I said, the problem is that if we don't feel life from our chanting, then we can lose faith. Does this Maha Mantra really work? Or we can lose faith and we can think, well, maybe it works, but I just can't chant it properly. I'm too fallen. But neither of those are true. It does work, it is full of potency, and, and anyone can chant it and feel the potency. This past weekend we did a retreat, and most, if not, I would say most of the people at the retreat were chanting Hare Krishna for the first time, and we did a japa session, and so many people got so much out of the japa session the very first time they ever chanted. So the Maha Mantra does have power if it's taken properly. They were very open to chanting, and Therefore, they got a lot out of it the very first time they chanted. So, we, we might lose some faith after chanting for a long time improperly because we're not getting as much out of it as we could. So, that's why it's so important to chant properly because when we chant properly, then it reinforces that faith because the mantra becomes alive and it enlivens us, it empowers us. It allows us to taste Krishna, to feel His presence and so forth. So, I'm going to read the next section, but if you have any questions on that, feel free to ask before I go on. I'll wait a minute here for you. Are any of you having trouble watching this? Is it what Dr. Jeff said? It's too laggy to watch. Is a Japa retreat full? I think it is. What you can do is call 888-JAPA-108. I don't think they have any more room there, but since you're not far away, call them and say, I'm ready, is there room? And see what they say. Okay. It's fine here. It's okay here. Okay, so just... Just Bhakti Jeff has trouble. All right, so let's read the next session. This is called, It's All About a Relationship. Although chanting revives our relationship with Krishna, chanting is also our relationship with Krishna. We are there with Radha and Krishna while we chant. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, To welcome the holy name. Radha and Krishna come to me when I chant. Do I realize this? Do I welcome them and, and take care of them when they come? Do I worship them when they come? Or do I think, oh no, I still have six rounds left. If I think this way, I simply take chanting as a process. A process, a process that often I can't wait to end so I can get on to more important things. Have you ever felt that way? 
Oh no, I have so many rounds left. I have to get on to more important things. It's not a very nice way to treat Krishna, is it? Not at all. Now let's go back to some of the things I said. The first thing I said was, although chanting revives our relationship with Krishna, chanting is also our relationship with Krishna. So when you're chanting, and we had discussed this before, one of the easiest ways to bring awareness to your chanting and help you control your mind is just think, Krishna's there, and this is a relationship, and I'm praying to Krishna, I'm, I'm talking to Krishna, I'm with Krishna, I'm exchanging with Krishna. I mean, isn't this wonderful that, that Krishna is so kind, God is so kind that He allows us to associate and exchange with Him, and, and, and in many ways Krishna speaks to us when we chant, because He purifies our intelligence. We can hear Him more clearly. It's such a wonderful thing. And if we think that way, then when we're chanting, it just brings our mind right into focus. It, it, it helps control the mind so much. Krishna is here. Sometimes I like to think that Krishna is sitting right next to me when I'm calling him. He's come and he's sitting there with me. This morning I was speaking with the devotee, and, and the devotee said, thinking of someone also means to think how they feel. It's just like, for example, if you told a friend you're coming over at a certain time, or if you told your mother or father I'm coming home at a certain time, or you told your husband or wife I'm coming home at a certain time, and you didn't come home at that time, and you didn't call them, and they began to worry about you, and when you got home they'd say, well, didn't you think of calling me? And what they really mean to say is, didn't you think of how I would feel? So, so... You know, a lot of times we don't think Krishna has feelings because we think, well, he's transcendental and nothing bothers him, right? So how, why would he, he never feels bad. But one of the things we learn is that Krishna does care that persons like ourselves are not with him in the spiritual world. So in that sense, he does feel bad. And if we are doing bhakti properly, if we're coming closer to him, if we're chanting his name properly and he sees that we're becoming purified, that means that he's feeling good about what we're doing. And, and we could say also that if we're not chanting well, if we're not coming closer to him, then he's feeling bad, that here's one of my children who is, who is moving away from me. So, the word yoga means to connect. In Bhagavad Gita you have so many kinds of yoga there's the yoga of action, there's the yoga of buddhi intelligence, there's dhyana yoga, the yoga of meditation, there's bhakti, the yoga of devotion. There's all kinds of yogas. So yoga means connect. So everyone is connected with Krishna, or yeah, everyone is connected with Krishna, but some people are trying to disconnect, and that's called vi-yoga. So everyone's practicing either yoga or vi-yoga. At every moment you can be a yogi or a vi-yogi. You can be doing yoga, which is connecting, or you can be doing vi-yoga, which is disconnecting. So if we're connecting, Krishna's happy. Oh, here's one of my children connecting with me. And if we're being a vi-yoga, vi-yogi, we're disconnecting. We're forgetting Krishna. Our heart is not coming closer to Krishna. It's not being purified. So then we're disconnecting, and, and that makes Krishna unhappy. So if we care about how Krishna feels, then we should become Krishna conscious. We should become better devotees. That will make Krishna feel good. So when we're chanting, we can think, this is pleasing to Krishna if I'm becoming purified. If I'm becoming a better devotee, if I'm chanting properly, <coughs> excuse me, then that, that makes Krishna happy. So we can think, Krishna, how do you feel now? How would you feel if, I'm, if I don't serve you? If I don't become Krishna conscious? So we can be a little sensitive. Krishna says, Aham bhakta paradino. The devotee is in my heart and I am in their heart. So there's this relationship. And that's what Krishna wants, just the heart. And that makes him happy. So our duty is to make Krishna happy. We are there with Radha and Krishna while we chant. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, To welcome the holy name. So we chant the holy name and we're welcoming Krishna. And what do we do when we welcome Krishna? We honor Krishna. Prabhupada said, when we chant, 
We are bringing Krishna into our heart on the jewel throne. We can picture a jewel throne in our heart and Krishna is sitting on that jewel throne and we're offering worship of Him. So that's what chanting is. We're bringing Krishna into our heart and then we're worshiping Him. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a nice meditation. Isn't it? Think, oh yes. Krishna, please come and sit in this, this jewel throne in my heart so I can worship you with your name. I can offer you the flowers of your name, the flames of your name, the incense of your name in devotion. It's a nice meditation. And of course, as we know, wherever Krishna comes must be very clean. So we don't want to bring, ask Krishna to come into a filthy place. So we want to make our heart pure. Krishna, come, please sit in my heart. I will clean my heart for you. You'll sit in there and I'll worship you by chanting your holy name. So that's the mood. Welcome, Krishna. Welcome into, I'm welcoming uh, you. Actually, Krishna is welcoming us, but we can think also. It's a, because it's a relationship, we can think also I'm welcoming Krishna. Okay. Do I welcome him and take care of him when he comes? No, now Krishna has come. Krishna, I've called you and now he's come. How do we take care of him? We honor him. So as I was saying, if we think if we think of chanting as a chore, it's kind of like being with someone and saying, oh, well, I, you know, it's kind of boring being with you. I really, I really don't like being with you. I'd rather be doing something else. And if you're ever with someone and you send that vibe out to them, that they'd rather not be with you, they certainly can feel it. So we don't want to send that out to Krishna. We want to have... Uh, we should never chant that way. We should, as far as possible, control that. We should never be apathetic. It's, it's so offensive if you think about it, just to be apathetically chanting. It's like saying, Krishna, I really don't want to be with you. I really don't want to do this. And that's why we're in this world. That's why we came. So we don't want to reinforce that problem, the very problem, why we're here. We don't want to reinforce it with increased apathy. So, we want to show Krishna that we want to be with Him, we want to show Him our heart. Okay. So before I go on to the next one, do you have any questions or comments? I'm answering all your questions, removing all your doubts. What happened? Sometimes it doesn't update. So mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I'll go on and read the next session. section. This is titled, Watering the Weeds Japa. Very unfortunate kind of Japa. The analogy given in the Chaitanya Charitamrita is that Bhakti is planted in our heart in the form of a seed and by chanting the names of Krishna, we are watering that seed. But it is also said, if we don't chant properly, we will water the weeds around that seed, and those weeds could starve the seed, strangle the seed, strangle the creeper. Poor chanting can actually produce misery, guilt, unhappiness, frustration, boredom, lack of energy, and a host of other negative emotions and experiences. Isn't that amazing? I'll read that again. Poor chanting can actually produce misery, guilt, unhappiness, frustration, boredom, lack of energy, and a host of other negative emotions and experiences. Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, a great spiritual master, made this amazing point. He said, the happiness and distress a devotee experiences is not due to his karma. It's due to his bhakti, either lack of or his his proper execution of bhakti. So he said, if a devotee properly executes bhakti enthusiastically, wholeheartedly, he'll be happy. And if he improperly executes bhakti, he'll be unhappy. And we all experience that, that very thing that he's talking about, we experience. 
if we chant properly, we're happy. And if we chant improperly, there's a whole host of negative emotions can arise. You feel guilty. I, you feel, I could have done it better. You feel, uh, I, I wasn't trying. Um, you could feel regret, remorse. You could beat yourself up. It's nice to be aware of that potentiality. When I chant bad japa, it doesn't make me feel like I am a blissful spiritual being. It makes me feel defeated for not applying myself. It also makes me both upset with myself for failing to come closer to Krishna. It also makes me upset for failing to come closer to Krishna. And it makes me feel guilty because I know my guru expects more of me and I could do better. It leaves me ent entering my day on a failed note. Wow! The very thing that is supposed to make me so happy when done properly has the potency to make me feel awful when not done well. Hopefully I can take this misery as a kick in the rear end and let it push me into chanting better rounds. So the idea is this awareness that when I pick up my beads or when I, whenever I chant the Holy Name, or whenever I do bhakti, there's always this potential to enter into a very deep, transcendental state of consciousness, or into a very negative state by committing offenses, by being apathetic, a state of, of a lot of negative emotions, and, and it's it's nice to be aware of that, that we have the potential to create either one. So anyone have any questions on that? Okay. So, okay, this next section, I mean, if you have any questions at all, just you can ask them while I'm reading it. And the next section is called, section is called, First Become Conscious, Then Become Krishna Conscious. This is a statement Srila Prabhupada made. It's amazing how many bad japa habits I have not confronted, even though I know how much these habits hurt me. They exist, I see them destroying my good japa, yet I ignore them. They have a tendency to somehow camouflage themselves in a way that says, I am here, but don't worry about me. And I believe them and think, okay, I won't confront you. Why? Am I afraid it will be too difficult or too much work to change? I must think it's less painful to change than to suffer the consequences of bad japa. I was forced to become fully conscious of these bad habits, confront them and deal with them at the retreat. This was one of the best things I've ever done. If I didn't do this, I don't know how long these habits would have continued to undermine my potential for, for better japa. So I think we all run into this problem, and the problem is we don't confront the problem. At the Japa retreat, we do different exercises and we ask people to deal with their problems in Japa. And one of the things we find, and everyone admits this, is that they already know the problems. They don't have to go through a process. I put them through a process to isolate the problems, and then we put them through a process to deal with them. But every, everyone knows we don't have to go through any process because we already know what the problems are. But the problem is we don't always deal with them for different, for various reasons. One of the reasons could be that it's difficult to deal with them, and uh, we'd rather not do something difficult. Or maybe we don't know how to deal with them. Or maybe we just don't feel like dealing with them, or we don't have enough energy to deal with them. Or maybe we feel, uh, I've tried to deal with them in the past, and I've just reverted back to my old ways. Whatever the case is, I recommend strongly that we confront whatever obstacles are there, whatever bad habits we have in chanting, and deal with them. And just look at them in the face, square, squarely in the face, and say, this is what I do, this is how it's hurting me, 
And what can I do to improve? What can I do to alter this behavior? What can I do to overcome this particular bad habit? And just by doing that, you'll see that your chanting will become so much better. What it does is it just makes you conscious, conscious of what you're doing. It's a very simple thing. If you're doing something wrong, you're not conscious of it, then, then you're probably going to keep doing it. Whereas if you just bring into awareness that you're doing this, then when you do it, you catch yourself doing it. Whereas if you don't bring that into awareness, then you do it and you may not notice. You may chant many rounds and not notice you're not listening. You may not notice you're distracted. But if you bring into your awareness or bring it, make an intention to, be, to concentrate, to focus, then you become aware of it. And you make an intention to deal with it. Like, okay, I don't focus as much. So what can I do to focus? I don't focus as much as I should. What can I do to focus? How can I deal with this problem? What will help me? Should I read some verses before I chant? Should I make uh, some intentions? Should I recite some affirmations? Should I chant some other mantras first? Whatever it may be. So that's the point of this. Become conscious. Become conscious of your habits. Become conscious of how you're becoming distracted. And then um, tackle them head on. Deal with them. Now I made another point here. And the mind says... Uh, the way this works is these problems become camouflaged. You know, they kind of hide. I have this problem, but it's like it's. I don't deal with it, it's hiding, it's camouflaged. Then my mind says, well, don't worry about it. It's okay, it's not that bad. So I kind of just let it go, I don't deal with it. So we shouldn't buy into that idea that it's okay. No. We should do whatever we can to improve, obviously. So. You know, don't allow your problems to become camouflaged and don't allow your mind to tell you it's okay, you don't have to deal with them, it'll just go away. I mean, some things may go away, but many things won't go away unless we really confront them. And the other point I make is I must think it's less painful to change than to suffer the consequences of bad japa. So, so generally, it's said generally that when somebody doesn't change, they think it's more painful to change even if they don't like the way things are they say well you know at least I can deal with this but if I change it might be too painful so often the reason we don't confront a bad habit is we just think well it's going to be so difficult to deal with that it's going to take so much energy uh, and I don't even know if I'll be successful it's just easier to stay stuck where I am than make any changes even if being stuck is making you miserable Sometimes you might think, well, I'll even be more miserable if I try to deal with it. But that's never true. It's never true. I guarantee you. You won't be more miserable. 100% money back guarantee from the Mahatma Das. Make the change. You'll see. It's worth it. Believe me. It'll be less painful if you change. Okay. Any questions on that? Oh, Gautam says, I feel, feel very sad and frustrated when I forget Krishna, even if it's for a few seconds. Oh, Gautam, is very Krishna conscious. It said in the Bhagavatam, it said that forgetting Krishna for one moment is the, the greatest loss. Now, can you imagine always being in that consciousness that if I, if I forget Krishna for a moment, that's going to be the greatest loss of my life. Yes, it's true. It's good that you feel sad when you forget Krishna. We should all feel sad. Okay. Now, we're going to go on. This section is titled, What I do today affects my chanting tomorrow. What I do when I'm not chanting affects the quality of the rounds I will be chanting later. For example, if I am critical of devotees, or even critical of non-devotees, it will be more difficult to chant good rounds. If my mind is engaged in activities from morning to night that have nothing to do with Krishna, my attraction to chanting the next day will diminish. However, if I make an effort to be as Krishna conscious as possible during the day, my rounds the next day are easier to chant and more relishable. My activities today are linked to the quality of my japa tomorrow. One devotee told me that if he goes out and tells other people 
about chanting, his rounds are always better the next day. So, of course, we, we talk so much about how to improve chanting during the chanting process. But we, we haven't talked, although we talked a little, we haven't talked a lot about how to pro improve chanting when you're not chanting, because what we all do when we're not chanting affects what we do when we chant. One time Srila Prabhupada was joking, and after he finished his 16 rounds, he said, he put his beads down, he said, now I can do any damn thing I want. So he's imitating that kind of thinking. Okay, I just have to get my 16 rounds done. And once I do that, I'm okay. So now I can do anything I want. So obviously not, that's not the idea. And obviously if those 16 rounds were good, one wouldn't think that way in the first place. But, you know, chanting is a holistic process. Spiritual life is a holistic process. And sometimes, unfortunately, we do things which actually contaminate our consciousness. And then, at least in my experience, is that often when I'm chanting, if my day has not been Krishna conscious, then when I'm chanting the next day, what happens is it, it takes me so many rounds just to just to clear my consciousness of the lower modes of nature, just to clear my consciousness of the modes of passion and ignorance. So it's like I'm starting in the negative. And it takes me so much chanting. I have to chant for an hour just to get out of all the dirt and the fog. Whereas if my activities are Krishna conscious in the day, then practically from the beginning my chanting is good. At least decent. And it doesn't take long to get it good. So so that's important. And then you could take it a step even further. If your activities are very, very Krishna conscious, if you've been very very absorbed in spiritual life, then that can energize your chanting. Then it's not even a question of you making a lot of effort to chant you, naturally your chanting will be full of life and tasteful. And there's another thing that Srila Prabhupada said that's very significant. He said if a devotee is engaged in a service that's very inspiring, then naturally they'll be inspired in their sadhana, in their devotional practice. So sometimes our chanting may be lacking because what we're not doing anything spiritually inspiring in our day. And of course, we have to work, we go to school, we have so many things we do. But if we are doing that from morning till night and we don't intersperse some inspiring activity, something relishable, something that's motivating spiritually to us, then it's going to be very difficult, at least in the beginning when we start chanting, to, to be really inspired by the chanting. We'll be, our chanting will feel like we're climbing uphill with weights on our back. So inspiration in service is very important. And how do you become inspired in service? Well, one of the best ways to be inspired is to find something that inspires you. A lot of times we look for inspiration outside of ourselves. We look for others to inspire us, to hear a class or read something inspirational. But there's a problem with that. We can become overly dependent on outside sources of inspiration. And that's a little bit artificial, not entirely, but a little bit. But if we are engaged in spiritual activity, which is naturally inspiring to us, then what happens? We don't have to depend on other people to inspire us. We're inspiring ourselves. Wouldn't that be wonderful to be inspired all the time like from yourself because you like doing something so much? You're always looking forward to doing it. You just love it. It's relishable. So when you find a service like that, that's inspiring to you like that, your chanting will automatically be better. So I recommend everyone find something that's very inspiring. Of course, in sadhana bhakti, we may, we may have to do things that will eventually become inspiring, but in our present state may not be inspiring because we're not pure yet. But still, that doesn't exclude the possibility of finding services that inspire you. So, you know, we all have different talents, different natures, and Different things inspire different people, but there's certain things that we you know, that inspire each individual, and <clears throat> we can look to them and see what they are. You know, what would, what could I do that I just would want to do every day? I'd never get tired of, and I'd always be thinking how to improve. So it's very, very, very important to think about that, because that will help your chanting so much. Okay, any questions on that? That's kind of part of what we call dharma. 
What is my dharma? Everyone has a different dharma. What is my contribution? What is my mission? What is your mission in life? You say, well, my mission is to be spiritual. But specifically, what is your mission? Get more, take it from the general to the specific. What is your mission? Well, I don't really have one. Well, think about it. What is your calling? What are you meant to do? Why are you on this planet? What talents has God given you? What does He want you to do? We all have different talents. And what talents has He given you? How can you use those talents to serve Him? Think like this. Ask yourself these questions. And that will help your chanting immensely. That inspiration will inspire your chanting. And your chanting will inspire your inspiration more. And your inspiration will inspire your chanting. So it will be a very powerful effect that will have a lot of momentum. Okay. All right, any questions on that? We have a quiet group tonight. <laughs> Maybe what I'm saying is stunning you and you have you're just speechless. Okay. You don't you don't have to have any questions, that's fine. I don't want to intimidate you to ask. Okay. So now, this next session is called... Okay, we have a question. What does one have, have to do when there is so much hesitating and problems with figuring out your abilities are? Oh, so, Kota wants to know, well, how do you... I think, I think first, he wants to know how do you, you know, get in touch with your mission. Uh, you, you have to... You, you, you can think of several things. You, I mean, sometimes they say, you know, what would you do? Like if you didn't need money, what would you do? If you didn't have to work, what would you do? Or if you, you knew you wouldn't fail, what would you do? Like, okay, I could do anything, I wouldn't fail, what would you try? Or what were your inclinations when you were young? What did you, what did you find yourself doing? You know, we have so many responsibilities, and sometimes those responsibilities cover our ability to get in touch with what's deeper in our heart. If you could do anything, what would it be? If you, on a, you went on a vacation, and on that vacation anything were possible, what would you do? And how do you want to serve the world? How do you want to serve others? Sometimes it, it, it takes a, a little bit of time to think. Let's say a doctor told you Go, Tom. Do you have one day to live? Is there anything you would regret right regret right now that you haven't done yet? Or is there somewhere that you were thinking, I would like to do this, I would like to do that? So you just kind of reflect, you know, well, if I only had a day to live or I only had a week to live, or let's say the doctor said you have six months to live, so you quit your work, what would you do in those six months? Is there, is there something in particular that you feel called to do? I've got six months to do to do this. I've, it's my last six months. What is it? Is, it was, is there a book in you? Is there a song in you? Is it, they say, don't die with your music in you. Is there something in you that has to come out? Is, is it a movie? Is it a documentary? A documentary. Is it a? Is it a video? Is it a? Is it helping orphans? Is it starting a school? Is it protecting cows? Is it growing your own food? Is what is it? You know, what what do you feel connected to? You have to ask yourself. What is your mission? You know, what is my life mission? What am I here for? And you can pray to Krishna, Krishna, please help me understand why am I here? What am I called to do? A, a lot of our calling comes in the forms of things we do really well, things that come easy to us. You know, says, what comes easy to me? What am I good at? What 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 is it that when I tell my friends it's easy for me to do that, they all say, God, oh, that's so hard, how can you do that? That's part of your calling. You are gifted because it's easy for you, you know. So many people who do wonderful things, they say, well, it's easy for me. How did you do that painting? Oh, I don't know, it's easy. How did you write that song? Well, it just came to me. How did you write that story? Well, it's just, I just naturally write. I don't, I don't know how not to write. This one, this one writing teacher uh, was asked, 
how do you get the inspiration to write? He said, I don't know how not to write. You know, so, so you have to look, you know, I don't, what is that thing that you don't know how not to do? That you can't stop not doing? Like some people, they're always singing. How come you're always singing? I don't know, I can't stop singing. So you can look like that. Um, Holy Grass, I want to live on a farm with a lamb by Krishna's grace, playing music for Krishna and everyone else too. Yes. You can start a farm, you can find a farm, you can study everything that Srila Prabhupada said about farming, what's the mission, how Prabhupada saw that in relation to the mission of helping other people. And there are many devotees around uh, on conferences that discuss these things. You can take part in that. It, it, it's, it's when you isolate, isolate what your mission is, what you want to do, and start working on it. When you know what you want to do, then every day you should do something to get closer to that. But if you don't know what you want to do, then you can't get closer to it. I understand. Thank you so much for encouraging and explaining so wonderful. But the expenses, holy grass, the expenses seem to always be out of reach, extremely out of reach. Well, the whole idea is you have to start with what you want, not with how to do it. How to do it comes secondly. If we start with how to do it, then we'll psych ourselves out because we'll think, well, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the energy. So we don't want to do that. We want to start with what inspires us and, and focus on that. And then begin to figure out, okay, how am I going to do this? What's, what's one one thing I can do? Let's say, so you want to live on a farm. Let's say, for example, or you want to develop self-sufficiency. So you have to start somewhere. Maybe the first place to start is simply read about communities that are self-sufficient. You know, different religious communities or different communes that are self-sufficient. How are they doing it? How do they do it in Vedic culture? In other words, you're, you're beginning the process. You're not doing the, you're not trying to figure everything out right away. So you, you take it step by step. I'll say, so I'm going to read, I'm going to study. Then once I do that, I'm going to contact some farms and, you know, visit a farm for a week and, you know, work with them, talk to them, say how I like it. And then from there, this and that. So, and so you, the main thing is to know what it is you want, what's your aspiration, and less how you're going to get there, but more what it is, and then begin developing a plan. How you do that step by step, small steps, or as big as big as as big steps as you are able to take. But not, you know, if you if you consider how how it's going to be possible. You may not know, just like Prabhupada said, the Krishna conscious movement would spread to every town and village of the world. And he said, how it's possible, we can't understand. But it's possible by the grace of Lord Chaitanya. So we have to have a little bit of that also. How, how it's going to happen, I don't know. But first, the desire is there. And Krishna, he likes to fulfill devotees' desires. So maybe if you have a strong desire, Krishna might send someone else into your life who also has a similar desire. And maybe that person has money, and you have knowledge, and someone else comes in and they have muscle power, or or they've farmed before and they know how to do it. So you know, you you first have to start with your your vision, your intention. This is what I want. And for some of us, it, it, we could be like Prabhupada, who had his mission when he was young. Excuse me, he had his mission when he was young, but he wasn't able to do it right away. But the mission was clear. You know, he he got his mission when he was like 24 or something. And, you know, he had three children, and he finally left his family, I think, when he was 59. But he had that mission the whole time, and he slowly he was gradually working on it according to the time he had. But he never lost sight of the mission. And then finally, when he left his family, he was able to fully dedicate himself to it. So, you know, that may, might be part of it, that this is my situation, but I have this mission, and I'm going to work slowly towards that. But I think Prabhupada's example is wonderful to follow because he never forgot the mission. You know, he got it when he was young, and then he finally came to America when he was 69, and he got the mission, let's say he was 23, 24. And so it was like 45 years, let's say. He had to wait 45 years before he could fully execute it, but during those 45 years, he was always fixed on it. He never forgot it. And he did what he could. So I think that's important. You know, now the, a lot of times we can't, we can't isolate our mission because we're afraid we can't do it. So to isolate your mission, you have to just 
forget the practicalities and just isolate what it is. What it is that I want to do. And then whatever it is you want to do, you, if you don't know how to do it, you can learn how to do it. You can find people who can teach you how to do it. You can work with people who know how to do it. See, that, that comes later. So we shouldn't get sidetracked and thinking, well, I can't isolate my mission because I don't know how to do this. No. You don't think that way. You think, what's your inspiration? What you would like to do? And then you begin to plan out how that could be done. A lot of people get sidetracked because they think, well, I don't know how to do this. But you can learn how to do it. That's all. You know, we should always think. There's, there's books, there's teachers, there's seminars, there's videos, there's tapes. You can learn how to do these things. And we get so discouraged because it's just like we, we think, I don't know how to do it, it's just a big blank. But no, you always have to take that step. You know, okay, what's my first step? I want to do this. My, my first step may be to go to college and learn how to do it, to take a class. That's why now I'm taking a class. Now I'm reading a book. I'm one book closer to my mission. I'm you know, on the Internet talking to people who are doing similar things. I'm two steps closer to my mission. Right? I've drawn out a plan how in 10 years I could achieve my goal. I'm three steps closer to my mission. That's, that's the idea. And then, you know what's going to happen when you're chanting? One big problem is going to happen. You're going to be thinking about your mission and you should be hearing the Holy Name. But you've just got to control yourself. You're going to be so inspired. You're going to get so many ideas how to achieve your mission. But that will inspire your chanting, and you'll, while you're chanting, you'll be praying to Krishna, please give me the power, give me the intelligence, give me the shakti, give me the enthusiasm, help me overcome my obstacles. And you'll, you'll be very focused. You're chanting, you're praying for service. Now you have this service. You'll be, you'll be so focused in your prayers. It's very powerful. So, someday, we at Bhagavad Life will get it together to give a seminar, a weekend seminar, on this very topic where you can go very deeply and look into your heart and see what is your mission. But until then, all I can do is ask you to go into your heart and start thinking, you know, what is, what is my calling? A lot of times people tell me, well, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't think that's really true. If you just, if you look at your body like a machine, Krishna says the body is a machine. So you look at your body like a machine. I, mean, so I like to look at my body like a machine. Okay, this is the Mahatma machine. And I go, what does the Mahatma machine do? Well, the Mahatma machine sings. He likes to sing. And the Mahatma machine likes to play instruments. And the Mahatma machine likes to talk. And the Mahatma machine likes to write. And the Mahatma machine likes to come up with ideas. I say, okay. The Mahatma machine likes to sing. He likes to come up with ideas, he likes to write, he likes to talk to people. So, so how does this all come together? So I was putting this all together. I thought, well, this all comes together in doing seminars. Because I can use my music in seminars, I can use my creative ideas, how to make them better. I can use my desire to speak. I love to teach, I can use my desire to teach. So it all comes together.